these are my uh, disclaimer and conflict of interest. Uh, and my talk today will be focused uh, on a different aspect of HIV vaccine. I will, uh, I will, will not have, well, I only have 20 minutes, so it will be too short to give you a whole overview of what is uh, happening in the HIV, you know, what happened in the HIV, but we'll focus more on what we learned from uh, the efficacy trials in the last year, during the past three years, uh, how uh, uh, we can, uh, and, we, and now we focus a bit on the uh, um, uh, rate of protection, particularly the uh, neutralized antibodies aspect, and what will be the new perspective in HIV development in, in order to induce these uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so, uh, as you know, so HIV, uh, uh, in spite of the many efforts uh, uh, in uh, research and development so far, particularly for uh, vaccine and uh, antiretrovirus, uh, uh, remains uh, uh, a very important global uh, health issue, uh, having claimed so far uh, about 40 million lives. Uh, and uh, the access to treatment and prevention approaches also remains insufficient uh, today and may also have even worsened uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. So what we have for prevention, uh, yeah, what we have for prevention today is mainly based on the use of antiretrovirals in treated individuals and may, uh, who may limit the secondary transmission or the use of antiretrovirals for, for as a pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis. We are still lacking a vaccine to be cost-effective because these antiretrovirals may not be suitable for, to vote for everybody, may be not cost-effective, is not supported by a strong healthcare policy. So why we need these vaccines, actually, and most of the models developed so far, and this is one of the most recent ones, uh, clearly indicate that if we have a vaccine with sufficient efficacy, and a sufficient efficacy will be about 70%, uh, and if this vaccine is introduced in the next decade, that it may have a very huge impact in the incidence uh, of the uh, uh, of the HIV, which is here emphasized by the dark blue curve uh, in this graph, and this could be by the orange curve in this graph, so, and this could be even improved by the combination of the vaccines with all the prevention approaches like DASP and the uh, PrEP uh, approaches. So, however, so far uh, the uh, uh, HIV vaccines development have very little success or no success at all. Uh, we had nine efficacy trials completed so far, and you can see in this table that only one uh, may have indicated some clues for protections. So we start by the first one, which was initiated uh, uh, in uh, uh, late 1990s, uh, and uh, which was based on a very rustic uh, uh, recombinant monomeric uh, glycoprotein uh, that uh, induced uh, uh, very poor uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies and no success at all. That way, what used in the first steps, so I will show you that in, in a second. So because of the lack of the efficacy of an antibody-based vaccines, the community at that time completely shifts the new concepts, and particularly the concept to induce CD8 T cells that may uh, kill uh, the infected cells at early stage of the viral replication before they can produce mature uh, viral particles that disseminate in the body. This can be achieved through recombinant vectors like the adenovirus uh, here, uh, that includes early uh, expressed proteins uh, uh, in the cell. The other concept uh, that came out at that time is that we may uh, uh, perform test of concept studies for efficacy called phase 2b. Uh, so with the aim to um, test the uh, vaccine efficacy in a small population with a high incidence, expecting to have more rapid results, more cost-effective results before going to large uh, and costly and long uh, confirmatory phase three trials. So unfortunately, in 2009, the community was shocked by the results uh, um, communicated after the DSMB uh, of this trial interrupted prematurely the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the trial because an increased risk uh, of uh, acquisition of HIV in the vaccinated arm compared to the uh, control arm in this study. 
So uh, this was not related to the HIV immunogen, uh, and so far the mechanism that are suggested and completely validated uh, is that the CD4 response, which is sustained in the vaccinated individual against the uh, uh, adenovirus components, uh, may represent a preferred target uh, for the HIV viruses for replication. And this was confirmed in non-human primate uh, uh, evaluations. So the breakthrough, however, the same year came from the RV144 trial performed in Thailand mainly, uh, where in this case, the objective was to obtain both T-cell immunity and antibody-based immunity through the combination of a priming with a viral vector, here the, modif the, here the uh, uh, canary pox, uh, encoding the uh, GAC pollen envelope uh, uh, HIV protein, and then combine it with boost of the canary pox with the uh, AIDS vax protein in order to induce also antibodies. And uh, the trial gave uh, modest but significant results in terms of efficacy, allowing at least to start to investigate the correlator of protection induced by this trial. So the first independent uh, correlator of protection that was found here are related to antibodies directed to the V1, V2 domain. These are non neutralizing antibodies. The activity are going through other functions of the antibodies that complement activation, maybe ADCC or phagocytosis. And you can see here that in the, sorry, in the, in the blue curve here, that those individuals that have developed the highest level of antibody have the higher level of protection uh, following the exposure uh, to the HIV. Other correlative protection were found uh, that are com combined variables, and particularly uh, the fact that the low plasma IgAs uh, again develop a correlate uh, with protection. There are no clues, however, in terms of mechanisms for this today, uh, but this is something we can consider for the future. Unfortunately, an enhancement trial uh, of the RV14 was performed performed in South Africa uh, uh, by the uh, increase of number of immunizations uh, and ad adapting the uh, uh, envelope uh, protein use uh, uh, to the regions, which is what the KC protein here in this case did not confirm uh, the efficacy of the RV144 trial at that time. In order to increase the broadness of the, or the coverage of, of the antibody responses and T cell responses that may, uh, uh, that may be elicited against the diversity of clades and variants uh, of the HIV. So the concept of, perf of building mosaic structures, uh, combining all the structure of the epitope of this clade uh, have been uh, also considered. Uh, and here again in a heterologous prime, with the vector here, an adenovirus vector, and boost with the combination of the vector and the protein in order to engage both T and uh, B cell immunity in these cases. This was the, uh, uh, the first was, uh, step was performed in the Imboco trial, uh, which also failed to induce protective immunity in uh, this population. And the sister uh, trial uh, performing in uh, Emerson uh, and transgender uh, people uh, has been communicated early uh, this year, uh, confirming the lack of, e of, e of efficacy of uh, the uh, strategy. So what may come next in order to uh, have uh, an improved protection? So unfortunately, we have the results of the uh, antibodies mediated prevention trials uh, in which the uh, volunteers were infused with broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies here the VRCO1 monoclonal antibody uh, the trial failed to indeed demonstrate protection in the global population but a fine analysis of the people that were protected indicate that these people were protected when they have uh, when they were exposed to HIV that were susceptible uh, to the to the neutralization by the antibody indicated that indeed these monoclonal neutralizing antibody or neutralizing antibodies are required for protection. Most importantly, from these trials, is that we obtain it in the analysis. 
uh, a correlate, a quantitative correlate of protection, uh, b indicating that a uh, neutralizing teeter of about 200 is sufficient uh, to induce the industrialization that may be used for the evaluation of future efficacy. So what are these uh, uh, are these neutralizing antibodies? I will not go into the details. I will need 20 more minutes uh, to go on this guy. But the important message here is that these antibodies have very uncommon traits. Uh, and these uncommon traits are related by the fact that uh, they, they require, for instance, to bind to the CD4 binding site of the trimer, sorry, of the trimer here, uh, um, a, proce a process, a long process of maturation uh, uh, in the body through the acquisition of very number, a high number of mutations that improve the affinity uh, to the binding sites, or they may require extended uh, a large uh, uh, structures of the variable chain in order to go deep in the structure to, to reach the hidden uh, epitopes uh, in the proteins and also to bypass what is in blue here the glycon shield that prevents the access of the antibodies normally uh, to these structures. So because of uh, these uh, uncommon traits, these antibodies are rare and were isolated so far only from the infected individuals. They need to be, be to engage uh, so rare germline B cells uh, by the uh, transmitted fungal viruses. And then the maturation of the antibodies occurs through the evolution of the quasi-species in the body. It takes years to obtain, in many cases, such type of neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, with broad uh, activity. So today, the new strategies in order to try to induce broad neutralizing antibody through vaccination exploits these uh, guide immune response uh, uh, approach. So e either by trying to prime the individuals with the identified uh, unmutated common ancestor structures of the viruses and then mimicking the uh, uh, sequential immunization uh, with new viruses engaging the maturation through hypermutation of the cells, for instance, or by completely redesigning the structure, uh, including the uh, initial structure for the primary, in order to have an improved fit uh, of the, the structure to bind with, uh, neutral, with the, these uh, broad neutralized antibodies like the VRC01. Uh, and to improve the engagement of these very rare uh, germ B cell lines. So the most exciting results came this year uh, 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 and was and they were provided by the group of uh, uh, Billy Schiff at the Scripps Institute, uh, where they finally achieved to obtain this kind of broad neutralizing antibody through the uh, immunizations uh, of a new completely designed antigen, which are oligomers, Structurally be designed to fit completely with the VRC01 class uh, molecule, assembled in a nanoparticle of uh, 60 mers, put it in an adjuvant ASU1, and the immunization of, of the individuals in the phase one trial uh, give rise to uh, uh, these uh, VRC01 uh, um, broad uh, class antibody that neutralize the virus, which you can see uh, in in. In, in this part, a very, very similar structure to the VRC01. So this is a promising approach indicating that we may be able to induce these, uh, uh, the, um, not only by the new technologies for engineering, completely engineering the uh, proteins. So uh, uh, Barney this morning emphasized that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, contribution of these uh, technologies uh, for improving uh, the vaccine design these structures, like the oligomers of the Scripps Institute, have been considered to be inserted now in mRNA, the mRNA of, of the, the backbone of the uh, Moderna mRNA. And there are three trials, phase one and uh, trials at the moment, that try to induce these prognotronated antibodies uh, through RNAs that uh, code for either uh, the uh, um, the oligomers of the Scripps Institute or uh, other type of uh, um, uh, of trimers uh, stabilized that are exposing uh, epitopes to the neutralizing antibodies. So to conclude for my talk, I think we uh, 
do not need, we, we need to not forget that uh, uh, they are still promising uh, 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 activities of the T cell immunity in order to control the HIV infection. These are results that, uh, that are coming from the Louis Speaker Lab, we, who showed uh, during the last years. Uh, that macaques that were immunized with a recombinant CMV vector encoding uh, the HIV, which is the HIV equivalent in macaque, uh, GAG and F proteins, uh, can induce T cell responses, quite unusual T cell responses, but that are able to control uh, the uh, virus replication in the body. You can see here uh, in the color uh, uh, arm, uh, in the anim animals in color of the arms, co compared to the blue animals uh, as control. So potent activity, and this may be combined uh, in the future with approaches uh, that induce neutralizing antibodies. These uh, responses uh, have been emphasized also to be uh, quite efficient here uh, in a therapeutic settings. So patients were uh, under our treatment uh, also receiving an anti uh, vaccine that targeted the dendritic cells in order to improve the T cell responses have a limited, a more limited uh, rebound of our replication uh, uh, at treatment interruption, indicated that T-cell responses uh, may also favor the control of infection. So the highlights from this uh, talk today at uh, uh, a vaccine will be needed uh, uh, to go to close to zero in the incidence of HIV. And this can be even improved if we combine, and I think combination will be the rule in the future for prevention uh, HIV infection. Uh, however, HIV is still a difficult target because the variability, because uh, the capacity to insert uh, uh, in the uh, genome of the host, uh, because also, and I have not talked today on that, uh, the d diversity of uh, transmission routes, particularly the mucosal levels, which require a different type of uh, mucosal uh, immune effectors, uh, depend, uh, in this case, uh, and because, of, co of course, the difficulty in inducing these uh, neutralizing antibodies with sufficient breadth in order to cover uh, the, uh, um, the diversity of the antigens. Uh, we are still in a very, uh, uh, in, a, in, in an area where we still need basic research in order to go further uh, in the prevention strategies. And we can also learn not only from vaccine strategies, but from pathogenesis studies, from studies in animals, and particularly uh, non-human primate models, for instance. So, and finally, the last word is that uh, uh, there is a warning alarm today in the fact that for the HIV vaccine development, there is a decrease in, in investment uh, that will be required, and particularly this is the case in Europe today. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Okay, open for questions. Yes, Christian. So thank you very much for an interesting presentation. So so I'm curious. So so one of the correlates that you think in the future would be necessary is local IgA or locally producing cells in the mucosal tissues. So one of the consequences of having local memory B cells and plasma cells would also be to have local T cells. How would that then affect transmission? Well, I think two points. First, the, the use of monoclonal antibodies for prevention uh, was uh, 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 through intravenous uh, uh, injection in this case, indicating that so uh, systemic uh, uh, generated immunity, actually, at least the systemic antibodies, because they diffuse to the mucosa, uh, may certainly contribute uh, to prevention. So... Uh, and this is a good news because we may not need to have a very specific local mucosal immunity for going uh, for protection. This was confirmed in the animal models many times. So there were many projects in which uh, the use of antibodies either locally or uh, through intravenous infection completely blockade uh, the transmission of the viruses. However, 
uh, I think that the mucosal immunity is remains a big challenge for all type of vaccines that uh, are trying to fight against uh, mucosal transmitted uh, pathogens. This is not only the case for HIV, uh, the genital mucosa, for instance, or rectal mucosa, but uh, it's the case for respiratory viruses also. And we need to invest, we still need to invest in the basic mechanisms of this immunology in order to see how we can guide or manipulate this uh, immune system in order to have a sustainable response and because the levels. Well, they're very quiet, huh? <laughs> yes. I haven't quite formulated this yet, I don't think, but in terms of Given the challenges with creating a vaccine for HIV, and I know you were very clear that we need to continue combine prevention approaches, and I know we're at a vaccine course, and these are kind of two different arms, but how much more emphasis should we be putting, particularly on yet yeah, has been prevention of mother to child transmission? That seems like, to me, the very logical way forward in terms of preventing new infections. Um, so how feasible do you think within the current lifetime? I know several high income countries are doing very well in terms of moving towards elimination um, with the current chemo prevention strategies. So do you think that that could be sufficient or, or do you believe that there's definitely needs to be a vaccine to reduce significantly HIV. I know the early slides you showed suggested that, that was the case, but I guess I come from more of a prep task background. So what are your thoughts there? Okay. I think it's it's not an easy question actually. Um, certainly the use of uh, preventive approaches uh, uh, with outside the vaccine strategy is efficient today. Uh, and it has been really demonstrated uh, in high income countries. And France was one of the leaders in the use of PREP, for instance, uh, for, for that part. Two, two things here that for, for being efficient, uh, the access to PREP or PEP uh, should be very, very, should be easy, should be facilitated. And to be facilitated, we need a strong uh, public uh, health policy for that part. And I think that was, this was a big challenge for all the countries uh, that did not support this. The second point of my answer is that in spite of uh, an, uh, 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 a quite good engagement of uh, the, uh, the government uh, in other countries for access to PrEP, we are still having new uh, infections coming every year. And this is pretty stable, actually. They are, the, the, the diminution is very little. So indicating that we need something else uh, to really control uh, the circulation of the virus. This and something that could be the vaccine. The only thing is that the vaccine should be sufficient, uh, with the, should have sufficient efficacy. And achieving 70% efficacy is a real challenge. Yes, up there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, with the R RV144, which showed efficacy of 31%, why wasn't that scaled up in high endemic areas? Sorry, if you can repeat your question. Why wasn't, wasn't that vaccine scaled up in, in high endemic areas in uh, places like uh, some parts of Africa? Probably because uh, the... Uh, the lack of the induction of sufficient antibody levels and sufficient protective antibodies. In the RV44 trial, also the neutralization activity was not a correlate of protection uh, as an individual co correlate of protection. There were some neutralization activity that was found. Uh, and if you look at combined correlate of protection, for instance, low IgA, the neutralization activity is one that came up in that case. So probably in the RV44, also neutralizing antibodies were not the major correlate of protection. They would, they have been contributed to, to the control. In the tight trial, the induction of the neutralizing activity have, would have been much more difficult probably. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, for the vaccine that aims for prevention. What do you think in the context now that we have drugs for prevention, how it makes the development 
of the vaccine more difficult or that it's raised the target of the efficacy of vaccines that should be ideal in order to implement with other mode of uh, prevention toolbox, in your opinion? Well, I think it's it's worse to introduce the vaccine in the toolbox for prevention. Also, we have the other approaches for prevention. The uh, I, I think that the, there is the lack of investment in HIV development today is not necessarily due to the fact that there are other ways to prevent from infection. It's more likely due to the fact that this, scientifically this is a very challenging vaccine and need a lot of effort for basic research in these cases. And companies are, are not investing, uh, private companies are not investing uh, in this vaccine development. They will take the lead probably as soon as we have something promising in phase two. Uh, but uh, so far, I think the uh, major investment for vaccine development came from uh, public investment or philanthropic uh, 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 activities. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Okay, we'll have yes here and then up there. Um, for the RV144 trial, if I remember correctly, there's, uh, they used two different uh, vaccines which individually were not really efficacious. Um, for for new trial designs, um, are, are they still using like combinations also of you know different vaccines uh, targeting different targets? Well, <clears throat> so far there are very little number of uh, vaccines already engaged in clinical trials, so there is a decrease in this uh, investment, but. Uh, and the, uh, the, the community, the scientific community, we, we focus on proof of concept studies in order to endure these broad neutralizing uh, activities. But the future for the vaccine, I think, is really to obtain broad neutralizing antibodies combined with a good T cell immunity. And probably to obtain these both arms of the immunity where we need to continue working on combined immunogens uh, like the vectors and the uh, uh, proteins or new designs for proteins or particles for TSP. Could you please tell us what is the target efficacy for an HIV vaccine? Something that you know developers have in mind when they when developing a vaccine. The reason why I ask that is you know we we saw a presentation from malaria earlier, where even a modest efficacy could have a really huge vaccine preventable disease uh, impact. And also, WHO held a consultation for a gonorrhea vaccine where we saw modeling studies that even with efficacy between 40 and 50 percent given to a very specific high-risk group, you could really achieve a huge impact. So I'm wondering whether you could tell us anything about similar type of analysis for, for HIV. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not expert in the modeling, but uh, all, all, although the models show that uh, below 75 percent 60 percent 70 percent 60 percent actually the impact uh, of uh, the uh, vaccine will be very little in terms uh, of control of the incidence of HIV. okay we'll go back here we'll <laughs> sorry for another one um but then in terms, I guess, of testing an HIV vaccine, given the prevention strategies we have, would these all be looking at non-inferiority trials against PrEP? Like, is it, it's not really ethical to test against the placebo? It's not ethical to continue testing vaccines without PrEP. So that's what's happened in the last trials, yeah. actually. And the uh, Mosaic trial was indeed uh, doing that. So they were including people uh, at the beginning that were not users of PrEP but they provide PrEP during the trial mm -hmm. and they continue to provide the PrEP. So the efficacy was evaluated in combination with the PrEP. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering if there's been any um, benefits to researching those who are uh, non-progressors of HIV, I think it's like no. CXCFI, and, and how that has contributed to, to the vaccine um, work that's being done right now. Yes, for sure. Uh, this is why I was emphasizing that the study on pathogenesis and our reservoir would be continued to be important for developing any type of prevention, actually, and of course, vaccine in particular, uh, because we need to still learn on how the immune system may control uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the virus replication, including also uh, in ways on what the innate immunity may help to induce a vaccination, how we can 
also try to manipulate this innate immunity through vaccination, which could be an interesting uh, new approach for the future. Great. We're going to have, well, two more questions and that's it. Okay, so go. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Emmanuel. Two quick questions. Uh, one is uh, there was early work around uh, looking at uh, discordant couples and trying to see if they could offer some kind of information around the correlates of protection. So I don't know how far that has gone. Then the second quick one is how would you design phase three trials in these kind of circumstances where there's quite a lot around prevention and there's definitely we didn't have any breakthrough cases? Thanks. Well, uh, for the first question, if I understood where, how we can go deeper in the analysis of uh, correlate of protection, right? If that's the question. Uh, there is a large effort doing by uh, Gavi and Chavi at the moment. They're trying to exploit uh, very carefully all the samples and data collected during the phase three trials. So there is still a lot to do, to do, to learn uh, from these trials. And uh, I think it's a remarkable organization uh, that was uh, used for this trial in order to preserve sufficient samples to go for the case and the investigation of the correlative protection. How we can design new phase three trials, I think that uh, this is a challenging question. The, what's for sure that uh, is not an easy uh, under, uh, endeavor to, to go for phase three. Uh, the uh, the uh, the example that we only have nine trials completed so far uh, since we discovered the virus in 1983 emphasized the difficulty in going even in the early uh, developments where there are there were no uh, such a competition i would say maybe with all the prevention approaches so to go for further uh, phase three trial we will need a lot of uh, proof of concept trial before phase one phase two studies in order to clearly demonstrate that uh, we are reaching this correlated of protection particularly uh, for the antibody levels i'm not sure that we will have a phase three trial in the very near future uh, thank you my, my question is uh in relation to the failed RV144 trial, I think one of the reasons you said it was because of, it was inducing, I think, CD4 cells within the mucosa, which increased the HIV infection. And uh, we know that uh, if you have to design a vaccine which will be effective in uh, uh, eliciting the antibodies, you need CD4 uh, T cell help. So how are you going about it? Well, my interpretation, and this is really my interpretation of that, is that uh, w you were talking about the step trials, so not the RB44 in this case. The fact that we were using a T cell based vaccine only without any component of the antibody that may blockade the entrance of the virus into the cells or complete the efficacy of the T cells was one of the reasons of the fa of, of this failure. And the, and the, it maybe happened that these particular adenoviruses had indeed induced some kind of persistent CD4 uh, T cells that uh, induced this kind of activation. In animal models, we observe this type of enhancement of susceptibility to infection uh, with many other type of vaccines, though this is not only related to the adenovirus vaccine. When we were using in our lab DNA vaccine that were designed to induce T cell only, we also induced CD4 T cells and we saw an enhancement uh, because there were more CD4 T cells susceptible in the uh, vaccinated animal than the, in the other. So I think this is a major issue. And this is why we, if we are going for a T cell based vaccine, it should be absolutely combined with an antibody based vaccine that we will blockade uh, the uh, access uh, to this CD4 uh, in this case.